and in the script there are assets from YouTube, Getty Images, Instagram, Twitter, etc. And it's just it's it's news about mostly music. Like like before working at Billboard or the Hollywood Reporter, I was I was very behind the times. But now I I am proud to say I you can play me any song and I will I'll know the artist like right away because it's I'm like very indoctrinated with it now. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by my old pal, businessman, associate, Matt Damiano. He's a New York City-based editor and filmmaker. Um, To kick off every episode, Matt, I like to ask with a really hard question, and then I'll bring it back to something simpler. Um, So to start out, how has where you're from, which is good old Baldensville, New York, shaped the professional you are today? So, uh, being from Baldensville, um, that has shaped the, you said filmmaker, right? Yeah. The professional. Oh, the professional I am. Um, well, being from that area, like not a lot went on really. It was just like us and like you kind of partially inspired or motivated me (laughs) to, get into it with your skateboarding videos, which you've talked about with like, you know, Kyle, I saw Andrew fed the, it's, you know, we we're from the same, the, the same cloth, I guess, or, but I didn't skateboard, but you know, us taking those classes in Forte's class, um, like his media production classes, like that kind of set me on this path and, we kind of owe it all to Mr. Forte. <laughs> we've, we've given him shout outs before. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I was worried about using his name just now, but yeah, it, it kind of all came from there. And like when, when we were like graduating, it's like, well, what am I going to do? And it's just like, you know, this seems to be the most fun. So what were some other career paths you considered or stuff that you could be doing if you weren't? Didn't well, go I, into media? I know you've always joked about me becoming a dentist, but that really was like never in the cards for me. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not like a math or science guy. And like my parents were like always concerned and and like, especially I'll talk about it later, but like over the past few years, very concerned about like the field I went into, but I was never um, like, I kind of had like a bleak view of where I was going, (laughs) like in high school, (laughs) they wanted me to be a dentist Uh, They wanted me to go into something safe, like accounting. And it just, it never like that stuff never clicked. So it would probably would have been like graphic design maybe, or something along the um, lines of creativity, I guess, because that stuff was always part of my past. Like um, talk about that a little bit. What are some things that you did like early childhood, early childhood? Um, Creatively. Creatively was definitely drawing. Uh, I like along with like the media classes we took, I did like, I did painting. I, I took painting and drawing very seriously in high school um, and then deviated into media stuff, but um, drawing, painting, uh, comic books and cartoons were a big influence on me as a child. Um and then also like doing uh, music stuff. Like I played piano for a little bit and then guitar and video production kind of takes those things and puts them together. So it just, that's how it made sense to me. Um, not so much like, I know like, you know, like I watched Kyle Kroll's thing and where like he was very, um, he really likes cameras and for me it's more about storytelling i guess uh i never really cared about like the the technical side of things but um for me it was always just being story focused and like making sure that whatever i'm making looks good uh so yeah (laughs) were there were there any particular projects that you remember that stick out in your mind uh whether it was in the, the media production class or something else 
Um, well, from those days, like it probably wasn't until college I really started to like, like give a shit. Um, like Forte's class, like yeah, that was that was like the seed, but um, like that that just made it fun. Uh, but I didn't start taking it seriously until I was in college, and I was like part of groups like UBTV. Um, I went to University of Buffalo to, um, yeah, like UBTV, um, working with like my friend, uh, Colin Burgess on like his comedy stuff, uh, back, back in those days. Um, the, the Zales guy, right? The what? The Zales, Zales guy? guy. Yeah. <laughs> he is, he has a doppelganger, like, <laughs> like an uncanny doppelganger, <laughs> um, we didn't work on sales no but uh he had a he had a show and just like those times um were fun and then the stuff that you and i did again that was inspirational but like when we made like and i'll talk about lightfall later or something like that but sure um like that was a really like dipping my hands into like like a heavy production side of things, but very DIY, like doing it all, like all by ourselves was, which was what made it good. So when we were graduating high school, me, you and Andrew Baker, who is also a previous podcast guest, we had a lot of options for schools to go to. And I ended up at Oswego. He ended up at Oneana. You ended up at UB. Um, What brought you there and how was their media program different than what Andy and I got into? Um, what brought me to UB was just like, actually that decision of what brought me there was just because like a, a few of the guys um, that worked at UB TV uh, went to our high school and they, um, they like I. It was just like seeing like a, an like an older brother or something like go through the motions of of their program. Um, little did I realize just how, and this is actually kind of a, a benefit. But UB University at Buffalo's uh, media studies program is like uh, renowned for being uh, experimental. Um, like very experimental it's like very not practical at all uh, or like you know I mean like there's there's practical parts to it but um, a lot of the professors were um, they, like uh, Tony Conrad is like a huge name in like uh, like the underground uh, filmmaking world and, and also the music world too like uh so that's what they were really known for. And th- that was kind of a good thing, I think, because it really opened my eyes and um, like broadened my horizons, which I probably wouldn't have gotten from like a, a like a very practical and like, like industry standard program, I guess. Um, like something like Full Sail. And like, I know that like Oswego is more of like a broadcast focused uh, program. I was kind of like a, how how would you say like, I wasn't, I was never in the program, but I was like part of things for students that went to Oswego a lot. Like, yeah, you were the audio cop. You were the sound guy. I know. I was <laughs> like, well, like uh, having, a, having a more contemporary program is, can be an advantage because it's not just like, here's how things are always done. It's more like you can go out and create whatever you want to create because this, the whole model and the whole system's changing, you know? Even even broadcast production is done like remotely, super cheap. They don't pay anything, so it's like skeleton crew kind of thing. It's not like it used to be. Yeah, um, I, I think I guess like to take away from the the verbal diarrhea I just spewed about University of Buffalo is that um, uh, the 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 thing that's most paramount is like art artist integrity. Um, it was very uh, like a very again experimental but very artist focused like like the way that you would like view a a modern day film set or video production tv set whatever there's like there's like a camera guy there's a sound department uh there's a camera department sound department 
uh, production department, all that stuff. Lighting, sure. Yeah. UB's program was, you know, very do it yourself. Like, if you want a crew, you're going to have to do it um, kind of mentality. They, they didn't go over that stuff in any, really any, like, they, they touched on it, but they didn't, like, make it a focus, I guess. Um, which is, like, kind of, like, stark contrast to, like, a school like Full Sail, where, like, they breed you to be on set, like, when you graduate. The cadence and all that, yeah. Yeah. So it's just different in that way. And again, in, in that way, it can be viewed as good because it does kind of like, um, uh, doesn't put you in a box, I guess. It, it has like a very open-ended kind of artist-based program. So um, what were, and I'm thinking of a couple specific ones, what were some projects you did uh, early on in your filmmaking videography career that were like paid uh, or or part of UBTV because I'm thinking I know you've shot a couple weddings I know you've done concerts what are some other examples of stuff early projects um I, I don't know if this is early I, I mean like I, I feel like we're like a decade in like you know you and I so but I would say like the most important one uh because like the early stuff is just kind of like it's kind of like garbage <laughs> like I don't I don't hold on to those kinds of like you know like you just said like weddings like I don't it's like weddings are great, but like um, the reading league, uh, which you shot for because I wasn't available one time. Um, I kind of like when I was working at my first, first, first job or maybe my second job, I don't like the history is it's a blur, blurry, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, the reading league was. What was the question again? Sorry. So like early projects that you're involved with. Um, okay. So th the reading league was, I would say a great um, experience in that uh, the, the CEO of that organization um, was like just starting out and like, she was just like, we just need somebody to shoot this, our seminars. Uh, you have a, do you have a camera? Are, are you willing to work on the side of your full-time job to it, like, we'll pay. Um, and I was like, yeah, like I, I need money to pay off this camera. I just bought, which was a C100 Mark II, like, you know, six years ago. And I was like, my, like my, uh, my day rate isn't my day job isn't paying it off fast enough. So like uh, I stuck with them for a few years um, and I like they've I, I feel partially responsible, uh, very small amount because the the ladies and men that are a part of that group really like grew it exponentially. It's still growing um, in Syracuse. They have they went from like being in the CEO's like living room to like having like an office space um, in Syracuse. This episode of The Creative Truth is sponsored by Colas Modern, a family-owned art and design studio focused on producing contemporary furniture and home decor based right here in Savannah, Georgia. The company is owned by David and Lara Colas. David is a former podcast guest, so if you haven't listened to that one, go check it out. All of their furniture and home goods are designed and manufactured right here in Savannah, Georgia, handmade, uh, including this coffee table, which is like an absolute favorite of mine. So if you're looking for a personal gift with a story behind it, you can check out some of their unique cutting boards, so like their butler board, their cleaver board, or their fruit board, and more. You can follow them on Instagram at shopmodernheritage or find them online at shopmodernheritage.com. That's on Instagram at shopmodernheritage or online at shopmodernheritage.com. Heritage.com. Can you explain what their mission is or like what they do? They're a nonprofit with the mission to fight uh, dyslexia and other like reading uh, disabilities that like go like kids have growing up. Um, so for my memory, like they're kind of teaching teachers, they're giving teachers the resources yes, yes. to, to help better address those learning disabilities type thing. Yeah. Um, and like it, they, they go from school to school and like they were like setting up in like a gymnasium and like they would have like a new guest speaker like every month 
and give teachers the resources they need to um, help them like help and deal with kids. Like, because like before they existed, kids were just kind of getting like pushed through. They didn't have the adequate like knowledge and resources uh, before the reading league exist. So like a lot of people were like graduating, not knowing how to read. And that's a huge problem. So uh, the CEO of that company saw that and was like, what's going on? Like, she, like she, she was an Oswego professor too at one time. So. Oh, okay. I forgot that. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. So you like that particular project because it was because of the mission of the organization? The, the mission was great. Uh, and it just, it was a continuously positive experience. I felt like I was helping uh, like an issue. Um, like I, like I felt, I felt like I was a part of something, um, that was bigger than me. And like, like, even though like my role was like very small, um, like it did have a ton of outreach, uh, and that helped them get to the next step. And me just being part of that, getting them to the next step was, I felt very fulfilling. So, um, for, for people out there listening, um, I keep looking at Lily in the background. <laughs> she just stretched out. She just dozed off. <laughs> <laughs> she heard you. <laughs> um, people, I guess, like, if you're looking for side projects, like, just make sure that they are, um, they have, a, like, a, a purpose. Um, like, like for people that are just like looking to make money, like I, like I, I could not see myself just like doing weddings forever. Like, and um, I was doing commercials in Syracuse and those felt very like not knocking my job at CNY central, but it was just, it, it wasn't enough for me at the time. And um yeah, the the reading league kind of f- filled that void that I had. So. so it seemed like um, with the reading league you shot and edited. It seemed like at CNY Central, that's kind of when you started to go more. This is from my um, observation: is like more into editing and uh, less uh, less in production. Is that true? Is that kind of how that you kind of got more into the post side of things? Um, I loved shooting. Um, I'm but I'm happy I'm editing now. And like in my current job at uh, billboard, like they are trying to get me, like I will be shooting something in a few weeks for them. Oh, cool. uh, A a BTS. Uh, Of of BTS? (laughs) Not BTS. No, not BTS, the K-pop band. Although you cover them all the time. No, it'll be a BTS video. Dude, I don't think I would, they would let me on (laughs) anywhere near the BTS. (laughs) They're way, t- they're the Beatles now. So, Pretty much, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, Arguably better. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, I love shooting. Like I still, I, I still enjoy it. Um, but in regards to editing, like, like shooting and being on set uh, is kind of like a young man's game. And we're still young, but like, I just kind of looked into my future and was like, I was like, I kind of just want like to just, you know, do my job and like be done within, within eight hours. But like, if you work on like any film set, you're there for 12, 14 hour days, uh, probably not including travel time. And I was just like, that is not really for me. So that was never happening at seeing my central mind you. Um, like I was working like eight hour days, but it was not, it was, it, it pales in comparison. It was like me and a camera pretty much. It wasn't like an actual set, but when I moved to New York city, like the, the, the standards kind of got raised because I was in a different market where like the demands are, are higher. And, um, like you would need to be like on a crew in order to actually shoot things in New York city, you can't just like run and gun like you used to the, the logistics and like the, the optics of doing that, 
like because I think there are TV stations here in the city that like do have like run and gun one man bands and like that sounds like a nightmare <laughs> to me. Yeah, like like shooting at it this whole video like you have until two o'clock. Go like you. Yeah, I mean, like you can it would be like new style. And that was like the kind of commercials I shot was like new style. And you were in the advertising department, right? It, it was just yes. And it was it just wasn't like like not knocking the work that I did there. I had some very enjoyable times. Um, but just like the, the the shift, the change in market that I experienced, like I could not do a good enough job, I feel like here in the city. So it, while I'm here in the city, it's like and I did shoot things, too. Like I worked on. um the special without Brett Davis and uh, Chris Gethard presents. I was a camera operator for those shows, but those had full crews on them. So it's just different now, I guess in summary. Um, but editing is, is fine. <laughs> okay. So, and it seems like a lot of what you edit nowadays is for specifically for social media. Is that right? It pretty much exclusively. Yes. So oh. how, how do you like approach, like with the, do people provide the assets for you? Like just like a logo and an image and te- or like, how does that come together? We download assets from uh, like, there's a producer. I'm not the producer. Somebody writes the scripts, somebody writes the script and they voice it or they're, they're on camera for it. Excuse me. Um, and in the script, there are assets from YouTube, Getty images, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera. And it's just, it's, it's news about mostly music. Like, like before working at billboard or the Hollywood reporter, I was, I was very behind the times, but now I am proud to say I, you can play me any song and I will, I'll know the artist like right away. Cause it's, I'm like very indoctrinated with it now. <laughs> do you enjoy it? I do enjoy it actually yeah Yeah. I was thinking about that like a few years ago I was like man I don't know any like during the when we were in college like you would go to like a like a frat party and they would play music and I would just be like out of the loop I I wouldn't know what the music was uh I don't know when that stopped it probably stopped in high school or something like that where I was just like not I didn't know the top 40 anymore but it's like now I know I'm abreast with the the today's music. <laughs> so I do I do like it though. So you're creating like uh Instagram stories and Snapchat story. Well, where's your where's your actual deliverable going? Uh it goes on Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, uh on on Billboard site and sometimes the Hollywood Reporter too. Um it's it's those two brands really, Hollywood Reporter and Billboard, um, and it just goes online like pretty much to almost every platform. We haven't done TikTok yet. I don't think TikTok works for news stories. I'm not really sure about that. Um, but yeah, Instagram, Snapchat, all all the all the big players. Um, do you crop it for like YouTube first and then size it down, or vice versa? How do you approach that? Um, well, Snapchat is always uh, just like a different thing. Snapchat is like a like because it's tile based or, or snap based, where it's just like you know it the cuts are the like when the time runs out, it goes to the next part of the story, and it's kind of hard to. <laughs> for a while, they were doing that where they were having where they were having cut downs of the the original story, but it just was like too hard to have like a natural break in a sentence Mm -hmm. like if the sentence was too long and because there's like a time limit on a snap tile which is like i think like 10 seconds or something like that um so like now snapchat stories are written completely separately um instagram you actually can take original stories and just resize them um to the best of your ability and then put those on Instagram with like different graphics and stuff like that. So yeah. And um, COVID related, you're doing uh, what's your split between remote work versus going into the office? We, it was, it's been remote the whole time. Um, I went into the office by choice just to check it out and to get my badge. And it's, it's pretty nice. I'm pretty happy about it. We 
like the delta variant is kind of like um it, it's it, like i don't know what's going to happen they they said we're going to be going back september t- uh 13th and you know if things keep getting worse it's it's not bad in new york state so yeah we'll see what happens um yeah let's talk about um lightfall so i love the story of how that project came to be could you first talk about like the origins of before you found you know if the idea came to you before it was never like it was never my idea or i guess the idea to shoot it was my idea but like the creative side of it was totally um it was totally what's the word i'm looking for birth i guess by um the artist uh singer songwriter sherilyn jean and the um performer of like the the dance um chloe chloe uh walters now uh it used to be chloe labrick but she got married to our friend aaron um hey aaron hey aaron you're coming out here soon <laughs> is he really i don't know i haven't asked him but it'd be <laughs> that'd awesome he's sick yeah he's yeah. a very cool guy um i what i can't i i saw chloe do a choreography dance um segment at like an art show in syracuse and the music is beautiful sherilyn is a, is a great performer um chloe killed it and it was so beautiful it moved me so much it it moved like like i'm like shrek okay <laughs> like i i guess uh, like i i'm uh not really like i guess like art i don't know how to say this but you're like an like an onion yeah i'm like an onion <laughs> uh I, i'm just not as graceful i guess is the word um to describe i've never been into dance or choreography or any of that stuff is what i'm pretty much trying to say um but i was moved enough by what i saw and what i heard that i was like this should be filmed like this needs to be put on like on tape or uh, made permanent i guess is the point i'm trying to make and like um i approached chloe and Sherilyn about it that night and i was like i want to shoot this like how how can i make this happen and it just was like over the course i think it was like i saw it in 2017 I, like the fall of 2017 and then we shot it on uh in august 2018 and not then, quite because i was in savannah by then or no maybe i'm i'm off by here okay uh, go, we shot it august 2017 but released it maybe before i moved in 2018 like in may or, or um july it was july 2018 we released it um so what well, i saw the performance i approached chloe about it um i conceptualized how it should look so that, that that is the part, I guess, that is like my creativity showing through. But it was just like, okay, how can I have the light bend around Chloe? How can I have the camera moves kind of like, kind of dance with Chloe as well when she's performing? Um, and how can I also, um, I guess, like have it be as graceful as both Chloe's performance and Sherilyn's music without it not flowing together or not not stewing together like it should. So um what well, what was production like? How many people? What, you know, what, what kind of gear? I know we had we rented a sound stage. We we rented a small theater space. Yep. And it was like all black. All, it was like completely like black background because I really wanted to focus on uh, Chloe's performance um, and not have any distractions in the background. Like I, again, going back to like <laughs> how I'm Shrek is that I've never looked at dance videos. I was never a theater guy. Um, but during the pre-production process, I watched dance videos and I did storyboarding and um like i i cut the music up into the the song into pieces to fit like the camera movements that i was like 
trying to piece together to have it like flow naturally. Um, and this again was like, you know, three years ago that I was doing this. So I my like my memory's kind of shot on all the all the details. But shooting wise, it was the when the day came of production, it was like you, me, my friend Emily, my friend Dylan, uh my other friend Gene, Chloe and Sherilyn, and that was pretty much it. It was a skeleton crew. And we pulled it off in a day. Um now it's debatable if we needed more time, but I just think that uh, like we didn't like not everybody could be there for multiple days, you know. Um, so I was like, we, like the sequence of shots that we needed to do, um, like it just like it worked out perfectly fine. Like mm -hmm. we got it done. Uh, I liked the end product. I think everybody else was very happy with it too. So that was. I, I felt like it could have really not worked out any other way for my opinion. Yeah. I loved it. It was a fun project to work on too. Um, do you have plans for um, any upcoming like other independent films like that? No, <laughs> um, not yet. No. I, and I know this is like, it might be kind of disappointing for your audience that is like very like, you know, like rise and grind filmmaking people i just don't have that i don't have that drive in me really anymore <laughs> I, I, like the past few years like and for context too um i like i left cny central in 2018 and then i worked freelance for this current job for like two years while also doing like random production things like in new york city uh, to make ends meet. And I like only just got moved up to full time in June, like June 21st was my, my first full time day. So I got the full time job and I just, I'm like, okay, I like my artist integrity. It, it, you know, it's sad to say, but I'm kind of putting it to rest. I just kind of want to make money and like work a day job and like be like a like an adult now yeah again. there's nothing wrong with that you know you still get to be creative and you get paid you get a you know you get a salary yeah yeah um sure. I, like i know that that might be kind of disappointing to some people because nah, like, just just me not just me i'm the only one <laughs> i'm so sorry uh i guess uh, what, but you do a lot of creative stuff on the side for fun as well yes i i do i do draw a lot i write um, I'm working on a story uh, right now and I'm like part of actually like, like in a Swigo comic book club and where we like talk every week and like, um, but like we give updates on the projects we're working on and stuff like that. And that's a lot of fun. And I just kind of feel like I got settled. I've, I've only just gotten settled into um, the, the video production world where I just, I, like I'm, I'm just going to do this for like a few years. And then if I have that creative itch again, um, like in like six years or so, something like that, like I'll, I'll scratch it, I guess. Um, again, I did uh, creative stuff with uh, the special without Brett Davis and CGP, which were like full fledged TV shows. Uh, we shot every week. Uh, I kind of, I did that for like two years and like, that was like very like DIY. Um, like we, it was like a public access comedy show, uh, but it was so much fun. And like being part of that was also uh, very creative, creatively fulfilling for me. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's interesting how a lot of people that came out of Buffalo uh, are, you know, pretty mid-level successful in comedy uh already and uh and uh you one of your earliest projects survivor matt was funny I and please god uh, the, the, my point is i see you doing more in in uh comedy uh type stuff down the road which right now you know that kind of stuff shut down but uh yeah but yeah i think i mean i think you're hilarious i don't know 
I, I I don't know if I'm hilarious. I feel like I'm just mean. I like your your ogre brand of humor. <laughs> well, okay. I and you know I guess I, I don't know. Maybe what I just said was bullshit. Um, there there are there have been times like again through um my friend Colin Burgess who lives down here and, and is a stand up comedian actor. Um, him and his cohorts like pretty much like all the people that are from like the special and CGP are doing comedy stuff all the time and they're doing shorts and they're shooting things. And pretty much every time somebody asks me like, Hey, can you do sound? Like, Hey, can we, you know, do you want to shoot? Like, do you have a camera? I'm like, I'll be there. And that, that kind of went on for like two years. So like control alt delete everything I just said. That was kind of <laughs> bullshit. Well, when you're not when you're not doing anything, you have the freedom to do anything. You know, you have the freedom to do whatever you want. You can say yes because you're not tied down to doing other stuff, which is yes. like my struggle a lot of the time. I'm yeah. I guess I'm I'm lucky in that regard. Uh, moving to New York City too, by the way, um, like because like I learned a lot, and there were a lot of stories I heard from people that were like people who like party too much got burnt out and then had to move or like they couldn't make it in New York. And I am not saying I made it in New York, but I like just, I, I pretty much was like, okay, I, I'm only going to do video production, production stuff to make money. I, I, you know, I have a degree. I have years of experience on my resume, like good experience. There's no reason Lost you for a second. Well, or, oh, lost you for a second. Yeah. You're back. You said you, okay. you're not going to work in anything but production. Can you edit that whole chunk yes. out? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah. I pretty much said for better or worse, I'm going to be working in production. And it was definitely sometimes we're worse. <laughs> uh, like there were jobs and things that I, I did that I didn't want to do. Um, but they were like, film and video adjacent and I did them because it was a paycheck and like uh it was not creatively satisfying like anytime I was a PA I ha had almost never had any creative input whatsoever it was like driving trucks returning clothes you know getting the crew food or something like some something like that and it's like there's a whole generate like I, I understand that is that is how it goes in the industry unfortunately you got to pay your dues or whatever but it's like i in my opinion i feel like it's only getting worse where it's like people are are being stuck in the pa uh production assistant realm for way too long sometimes where they don't get to harbor those like those kind of experiences where it's like oh i wanted to be a camera like a cinematographer but i've been a pa for like eight years and i've like hurt my back or something like that like you know moving heavy objects like there's too many stories like that that are happening nowadays because i think people are, are there's a few reasons for that and i think that is um people are living longer so that means they have to work longer in the industry um and that's not just for uh that's not just for like that's all industries right now. So people are, are not retiring sooner. So there's less open positions or maybe, I don't know. It, this is all, this is a rant. So just edit that out. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody moving to New York city or LA, but specifically New York city, a big major market, um, a big major market, um, save your money. Uh, that's what, um, kind of kept me afloat I, it, it's very tempting to like just go to the bar all the time and like blow it all but uh i i i was pretty disciplined about like not going too crazy in the beginning and um just like i guess like try to network i did some networking things uh that i kind of felt were a little bit fruitless because one of the first net networking things I went to was like a mixer for like the editing union or something like that. I, 
I can't remember now, but like somebody was like, like, oh, you should just buy like an avid subscription if if you want to be an editor in this city or whatever. And I was like, do you know how much that costs? Like, that's like, <laughs> that's like horrible advice. Just go buy a red. Yeah, sure. <laughs> then you'll get work. I mean, I don't think the guy, the the kid that told me, and he was like young too, uh, like maybe he came from money or something like that. But I was like, I don't have, I don't have money to buy Avid or like, you know, I don't know if Da Vinci, I think Da Vinci is free, right? I believe so. Okay. Um, but yeah, there was, I, I did meet somebody from that. And I think that did lead to something else eventually, but it wasn't that kid. Definitely not that kid. Um so yeah. All right. What's the best part about living in New York City? The best part of living in New York City is that it is um, very diverse. Um, I love how like you know like every block is a little bit different, and then like there's like you know very green spaces that you can escape to. Like you can go up to like outside the city into like Westchester County. There's also Central Park, which is a big, you know, everybody knows Central Park, but there's also Prospect Park, which is awesome. Um, and the, all the food options too are great. It, I mean, like, it's like one of the biggest cities and it is, I think the biggest city in the world, right? Or maybe that might've lost the title. It's the best. I don't know if it's the biggest. It, it's definitely the best. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it's one of the, it's the greatest city in the world. So and, uh, that seemed like kind of like shameless <laughs> in saying that, but that's all right. We're, we're allowed to be biased. This is my show. We can say whatever we want. Okay. Um, so it, they, they, if they invented a cell phone that you can call back in time, you call your 17 year old self, but you, you don't pick up. So you got to leave yourself a voicemail. What advice would you give to yourself? Your 17 year old self. Um, like my voicemail, my first impulse would be to be mean and to like, say like, get your ass going, you idiot. Like, you know, um, but I would, I, the more mature 30 year old Matt would say, everything is going to be okay. Just keep telling yourself that over and over again over and over again, even when things get rough, because like, I still do that today. Like every time I'm like feeling stressed out about something, I'm just like, everything's going to be fine. It'll work itself out in some way, or you'll, you'll cope. And like, you know, it'll be it like, you'll, you'll figure, you'll figure it out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm sure your 17 year old self will thank you for that. Yeah. Um, any last words of advice for the listeners? Um, advice for people that want to get into what I do. Um, make a good reel, make a really killer reel. Um, it's all about who, you know, pretty much um, how I got my job was because I moved to the city and I, I kind I, very uh not a lot but i did like lean on my friends but and like pick them for like uh like who like who they knew was like looking for like editors and stuff like that and looking for shooters um my friend lucas gardner was uh the guy who was like hey you should check out the special like they're looking for a crew people this next season and that's just that one um just that one thing like got me like you know a few years of work and like a whole base of friends that i love dearly and like the the pandemic kind of shut things down for us and like we haven't gotten back to the 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 public access studio to shoot anything so it makes me very sad but yeah just a yes to things, I guess, is the advice I, I would I would give to people who want to get into what I do. Um, if there's an opportunity, just say yes. Just take it, you know. And good luck. Good luck. <laughs> so, so where can people learn more about you and maybe see see what you've been up to and uh, see uh, go, your work? Uh, to see my work, there 
there's nothing really you can do to you know there's no indication that i made it on billboard because it's it's branded like you know um uh the, i guess i you can check out some of my really old stuff on my outdated website at mdamiano.com um i'm not really pushing for that right now because i'm not like like I'm working on news stories and stuff like that. It's not really like real material. So you've made it in New York. You don't need to have that real anymore. I, it, honestly, the biggest takeaway is that I am, <laughs> this is like the worst, I might be the worst person to talk to. Cause I'm like almost demotivated from if I can be real for a second, like, dude, be real. Yeah. That's okay. what we like. I, I just was, I went into this, this thing with the focus of being like a good resource for information for people no, be oh, real okay um i'm not completely demotivated from like doing film or video production stuff but again like like i i i my sole focus was getting a job that satisfied me and uh you know could pay the rent and like had health insurance and unfortunately that's just kind of like like the, the way of the world right now is like, you know, if you want health insurance, you have to get a job and it may not be a job you want, unfortunately. And I'm like one of those lucky instances where um, like I, I got a job I want. It's in, it's in the field of, of study or like the field of practice for what I went to college for, which is extremely lucky. Not many people get to say that. And it's extremely lucky especially for like film and video production. Cause I feel like a lot of people I went to college with are not like who were like in my major, like are not working in film or video, like, you know, not knocking on what they do, but like it, it, it is extremely hard. I shouldn't say extremely hard. I feel like that's also like demotivating, but just give up basically. It's just the, give up. Just give up. No, no. <laughs> No, it's okay. We want people to be real. Like, and the thing is people have given the answer. Like I'll ask people, what do you do for fun? And they're like, watch TV. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> you know, it's like, you can't just be on all the time and you got to just do what makes you happy and helps you unwind at the end of the day. So yeah. like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but like I got, again, I, I keep repeating myself, but I got this job. Um, I, my creative pursuits and passions have kind of pivoted towards drawing and painting again, like kind of like satisfying that inner child of mine. Um, the pandemic really like kind of uh, solidified. I, I feel like motivated me to get back into that kind of stuff because like you're working, you, you can't go out like, and all you're looking, all you're doing is looking at screens. So uh, just doing something else besides looking at a screen, which is like all the, all our field of work does is like you're looking at a screen, you know, like whether it be a camera or a computer or your phone, like it's just too much of staring at like right now, like <laughs> staring at a screen. Um, so I've kind of like pivoted away from like media production, which I know kind of defeats the purpose of, of your podcast. <laughs> but No, man, you've, you've been great. I appreciate you coming on finally. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if this one, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll come back in like a few months and I can talk about the thing I'm working on, but, and give you the Matt Damiano bump of, of <laughs> <laughs> views. Um, no, no, it's, it's been fun. Um, I'll sign off and then we can talk a little bit more. Uh, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to help discover their path to success, make it in New York. And uh, if you have episode suggestions, episode or guest suggestions or feedback, you can email me at new email, hello at creative-truth.com. That's hello at creative-truth.com. And uh, you can check out merch. We're going to get a new merch store. We're in the new studio. We're moving on up in the world. Um Thanks for listening, Matt. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah, and we will see you in the next episode. Yeah.